what is your perception of and position on environmental justice along the Wasatch Front? My perception is that it's barely discussed, that it barely reaches people's consciousness, that they're hardly aware of it. I think it's just a difficult conversation to have in Utah, unfortunately. Located in the heart of the Intermountain West is one of America's vast inland empire, where people are free to work and worship as they desire. Utah. 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 The Rainbow Land. I've been saying that I was going to leave Utah since I was 18. <laughs> But I love Utah for what it is, and I will probably be here my whole life. Utah has changed dramatically in my lifetime, both for the positive and the negative. It's growing. There's a lot of economic development coming up in Salt Lake and in Utah, which obviously equates to opportunities. I saw bigger mountains here. That's where the industry was for snowboarding and skiing, and that's where the good snow was. There's maybe like stigma here, say, about the Mormon culture and the Latter-day Saint church. Just found like all around good people and good community. I can only really speak from experience for the past six years, but I think that Utahns as a whole are a very industrious group. We want to look for solutions. We don't just stop at the easiest answer. We really are compassionate of others. We really do want to help people because that's who we are as Utahns. Salt Lake City is, let's call it a wide city. It's wider east to west than north to south. I-15 runs fairly close to the middle, going north-south, and it divides the city into the east side and the west side. The east side is primarily residential. It does have the University of Utah, the majority of the hospitals. And then on the west side of Salt Lake City, we have the airport, another interstate, and the majority of what we call point sources, so industrial sources. The West Side is the place that my family called home when they first came to the USA. Living in the West Side, you look east and you're like, oh, the Capitol's there. Well, that's the people's house. Sometimes I would see the Capitol and I'm like, oh, my mom's there. My mom's working there. She's cleaning. I grew up seeing the Capitol, but I also grew up seeing all these refinery towers because that's where my dad worked. That's where he found opportunity when he came to the US. So I saw all this around me. And I just never really took it into mind, into consideration. Now in one of the prettiest spots in the country, the problem is dirty air. While this happens every year, this year is the worst anybody can remember, making life anywhere outside the home downright dangerous. I would hear in the news like, oh, it's better, don't go outside. I'm like, very healthy person, I don't need to worry about it. Two years ago, there was this huge inversion that happened. The air outside was just bad, and it was gray, and I felt like I was walking around through a bubble, like a dark bubble. And within five minutes, I started coughing, and my eyes started to burn, my throat was hurting, and I looked green. I'm like, what's going on? I had a hard time understanding what was happening but it was like literally in the air and it was right in front of me. I'm like, oh wait, it's the bad air quality. That's when I started to realize bad air affects everybody. 
It's just not something that's talked about growing up here in Utah. You just kind of accept it. You accept that your friends have asthma, that family members are developing cancers or other diseases that are being linked to air pollution, such as dementia and ALS. When I was young, I had a lot of breathing problems that could last up to weeks. I missed anywhere between a third to a half of a school year. I was fortunate that my parents were able to catch me up and I didn't really fall behind in school. Three or four months before graduating with my PhD, before defending my thesis, I realized that 50% of people believe in climate change here in the US but about 100% believe in lung cancer. And that's when I realized that if I were to really pursue this further, I really need to start looking at air quality pollutants, health-related pollutants. Here in Salt Lake City, and really most of Utah along the Wasatch Front, we tend to live really near mountains, which creates these valleys. Now, inside the valleys, a high-pressure pocket of air traps the air underneath. Because you have the mountains ordering it, you create this bowl and the air becomes stagnant. The emissions come out of hotel pipes, from a smokestack, even from natural gas combustion to heat our homes. And this pollution has nowhere to go. One of the largest misconceptions that I see is that people think that it's just industrial sources that are the largest emitters, and it's, they're really only about 15%. About 50% are our own cars, vehicles, and trucks, and about 30% is the building sector. Our city air is harmful. It's a scientific fact. Many residents are not aware poor air quality even exists. Early 2000s, I was, I was chasing snowboarding, wanting to be a pro snowboarder, but I just really wanted to be free in the mountains. Drove my 1982 Toyota Trekker, pulling a snowmobile. I really wanted to focus on snowboarding and see where that went. Snowboarding in the Wasatch Mountains, Ute Land. I can look down on where I live and millions of people pretty much suffocating and toxifying themselves by having to live in a highly populated area with bad air quality. Our community and the outdoor industry is escaping from air quality by creating things that are gonna harm the natural world and most importantly, harm human beings. And started researching. I know I don't want to be contributing to this anymore, so how am I going to change? Have I sacrificed anything in my life to live the way I do? The answer is yes. Ambitions and goals and drive. A lot of times I didn't travel to go see my family. Especially love for the mountains and my love for snowboarding. Ultimately, in retrospect, looking back, I don't think it has served the world as a whole on the level that is as important as you making the sacrifices to just put a little bit less impact and share that.
If we don't have community and we're not really bringing the community together, we won't ever understand what's different and what could be different. From my understanding, the west side is particularly affected by bad air quality because we are surrounded by a lot of things. I live right next to a freeway, so of course there's a lot of cars that drive around, and we're also next to a lot of refineries. Growing up, college was never really anything we talked about. It wasn't until I was in 12th grade five high school, one of the college counselors came up to me. He's like, did you know you can go to college? I'm like, really? That's for me? When I lived in the University of Utah area, I would walk around the block sometimes and I'd be the only brown person walking around. When you're the only person that's different and looks different amongst everybody else, People look at you funny and people treat you definitely very different. People question you more. It was hard for me to kind of find that connection. There's a point where I saw, okay, I want to see what else is out there in this world. What is there outside of Utah? And my advisor was like, you can go to DC if you want to. I ended up interning for a Latino interest group. There was a project where I had to do some outreach. There's a couple lists here that I had, and I'm like, wait, who is this lady? And my friend was like, um, she's a business owner. Wait, there's such thing as a Latina business owner? I thought being a business owner is only like a white thing. And my friend's like, no, you're not in Utah anymore, honey. This is DC, this is the rest of the world. It was a huge culture shock for me. I'm like, wait a second, like, where have I been living? I got into air quality activism because I was looking for an environmental nonprofit that'll give me an opportunity to advocate for environmental justice issues. I advocate for human rights because no one should be subjected to pollution or harm just because of where they're living or the color of the skin or who they are. We need to learn to grow as a community versus the capitalistic view of grow and get your money and get your big house and move away from the pollution instead of let's get rid of the pollution who's harming and affecting our communities. One of the largest problems that we have is that when we have those inversion events, those stagnant air vents, that means that there's no ventilation. Wherever you have a large source, it just builds up as a hotspot. When we look at a really poor air quality event, we see anywhere between doubling to tripling the absenteeism rate on schools on the west side compared to the east side. What this really means is that the students who may already be disadvantaged to begin with are now even further disadvantaged. personal experience, I know that going to school is an important aspect in order to be successful. I was very fortunate that I had parents that took a lot of their time to help educate me. And I do not think that it's necessarily the same experience for everyone. You live in Utah, you live here your whole life, and you're accustomed to certain things here. When I was in D.C., I felt like I was in my place. There was just so many people there. It was so diverse. And and that's where I started to feel a burn of, there's a problem in our state. 
my state representative. She's one of the only black legislators in the state. And so I was like, well, I would love to work with someone like that and just get to the grassroots of things and learn and educate myself and see what we can do to change things here in our state. Being in politics and doing advocacy work here in Utah is very tiring because it is a slow game and it takes a little bit more to change minds when it comes to new information coming out. So until Utah can get together and protect its entire citizens, I'll probably continue fighting for what's right in Utah. The industrial sector has actually been regulated for a long period of time, and that's why those emissions have come down a large amount. And I always ask people, well, when was the last time you checked your furnace at your home to see how much it's emitting? There are no regulations for that. So it is very difficult for me to hear people saying, someone else should fix this. When, for example, I see them idling, trying to cheat the inspections for their cars, and when I see them wanting to get five packages right now. Maybe not everyone can be towed. Maybe not everyone can live in a tiny home or change everything over to electric. But every small amount of energy that you put into reducing your overall emissions footprint is really going to improve our air quality. This is also a personal matter for me. I did have uh, respiratory issues, I still have them. If I can help other people avoid having these problems, if I can help even be a small part of the solution, I, it, it does feel good to be able to enact positive change. The work that I do, I can see its results. And I've been fortunate that almost all of the work that I've done has led to some community changes behavioral changes, legislative changes. Doing the little things that we can incorporate into our daily lives to reduce emissions is gonna have an impact ultimately, but we have to come together as a community and influence change. We can't just let our legislatures that are politically driven and economically driven run our cities make a difference. We teach you how to do that. We provide you all the information on the bills that we're working on and we teach citizens twice a week on how to lobby, how to meet the legislators and to show that it's a lot easier than most people think. We're raised to think that these politicians are almost an untouchable level but the only difference between politicians and you especially at a local level is that they ran for office. As I've become more involved, I'm seeing a change in the community and in our citizens, which will reflect what happens in our leaders. The internship ended. I graduated from college. I started looking around to see, okay, what's the best option for me? What are the opportunities? What do I want to actually do in my life? I got recruited from the Utah State Senate. They asked me if I wanted to work there full time as a legislative assistant, and that's where I'm at now. It's been two years. I'm in the room where it all happens. I'm there learning about the things that we're doing to make things better for all Utahns.